Brent, you're kind of making the point that the United States is in a better position than uh, the rest of the world as far as uh, because they have the world reserve currency, there's going to be more demand for those dollars inside and outside. And you use the point of quantitative easing as an example of needing more dollar liquidity. And then Peter was saying it's actually the opposite in his view. So uh, why don't we start by if you could just give me kind of a one minute uh, articulation of your view and give me that example of quantitative easing you're talking about, then Peter can yeah. kind of push back on that. Yeah, I, I think the point I want to make is I, I think a lot of people get cause and effect messed up when they're talking about monetary policy and what it does to the value of a, of a currency. Um, the whole point of QE is to relieve currency pressure or currency deflationary pressure. You wouldn't be adding supply if there was no demand for it. So the your reason you're adding supply is to meet that increased demand and not allow a currency to rise uncontrollably and wipe everybody out. Now, I don't actually like these policies. I'm not somebody who likes what the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world are doing, but I understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But and so, you know, if they're going to print another hundred trillion, it's going to be because there's a credible amount of deflationary pressure that they're trying to relieve. They're not just going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, we're going to print $20 trillion just for the hell of it. They will do it as a result of a crisis. And the crisis will be a rising dollar and deflationary pressure, not falling dollar and inflationary pressure. So, Brent, when you're talking about printing money, are you just referring about the... the or talking about I, I, should, the I, should, I should just... I, 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 yeah, I should just say QE. I shouldn't say printing, but it's QE. Okay, so just the Fed expanding their balance sheet. So you think they're expanding their balance sheet to relieve the dollar pressure outside of the United States? Both, 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 both. Okay, so how are we having dollar pressure inside the United States if prices are going up? Are you looking at asset prices? Meaning that if they're not doing QE, then asset prices are going to deflate? Let's, let's go back to March of 2020. Asset prices were not rising. Asset prices around the world, every market were falling. Every market. If you can find me a security that was up, in the week, the second week of March 2020, I, I would like to see it. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now- okay, Because so your everything point. was falling because everybody, the whole world needed dollars. And the QE response was a response to that dollar demand. Okay, so more asset prices, uh, correct? Because yeah, because if, if, if asset prices collapse, then businesses go bankrupt, jobs disappear, then, then shelves are really empty because you have a depression. Right, okay. So, Peter, wh what's your position there? Well, I mean, first of all, the dollar was up, but in the scheme of things uh, and relative to how much the dollar has gone up during you know, past crises, uh, the dollar's gain was was not that great. And in fact, there are many periods of time where the dollar was weakening uh, against the euro or the Swiss franc or the yen during those periods of time. So it might have been strengthening against uh, some other currencies, emerging market currencies, but against uh, certain currencies, the dollar was actually weakening. Uh, so I didn't see a lot of dollar strength there. But again, Brent, what you have to understand is the Peter, world, there's not one currency in the world that was up against the dollar in, in March of 2020. Oh, I don't remember the exact the, well, the exact. Well, you, 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 you find if you can find me one and you send it to me, I'll buy you dinner. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Pete. Let's it, let Peter it, it, continue. And and if the dollar was up against the yen or the franc, it would have been a very uh, incremental uh, amount. I mean, not like what you would have seen back in in, in the 80s, the period that you're talking about, or even what we saw in the aftermath of the 08 financial crisis. But you have to understand that what gives a currency value ultimately is the products that are produced by the nation issuing that currency, because none of these fiat currencies uh, are backed by anything anymore. Right. That's why they're fiat currencies. There's no gold there. So what gives a currency value is the goods that are produced by those the people in that country. And so the demand for that currency is a function of demand to buy the products that are being produced. And as I said earlier, we have record trade deficits. The world does not need dollars to buy American products because we're not making the products that the world wants to buy. We're not making the products that Americans want to buy. Americans want to buy the products that are made in China and other parts of the world. So on a fundamental basis, the dollar should be very, very weak. 
uh, given our, our trade imbalance. What's been propping up the dollar is simply demand for U.S. financial assets. And again, there should be no real demand for U.S. Treasuries because the negative yields are enormous and w nobody wants to lose money on purpose. Uh, so when people realize that those negative yields are going to persist indefinitely and they're going to get even more negative, there's no demand there. And I think demand for buying shares of Google and Amazon and Netflix and all these stocks is going to go away. I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time. They get your life. You are not even in a rat race. You're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know, but I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have and I multiply it with 1,000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available and multiply this with 1,000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1,000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1,000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? You, how should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave, you forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. Join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below, enter your email address, and I see you on the other side. Your Marco Stan.